Strong in the strength of Thank you. Thank you. Sixty-three. Give me the Bible. You ready? Let us sing. Give me the Bible, sorrow that is me. To the one hundred and one and ten stars, no star can hide that great into peace will be. Since Jesus came to the seek and save the lost, give me the light, the only message shining. Thy life shall guide me in the name of faith. Precept and promise, law and love combine. Till I shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken. When sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. The branches went by Jesus for the face where to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy I shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and prophets, my love, come on me. Till I shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible and of life in mort. Over of the splendor by the open grave. Show me the light from that big shiny port. Show me the green giving to its way. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy life shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise are not combined. Till I shall bend in the In our invitation song, the stranger at the door. Two, two, seven. Sorry about that. Got caught up in the singing and lost track. It's time to get up there, Gibson. <laughs> but uh, it's great to be here this evening. And uh, I understand that uh, Brother Giovanni is considering a Bible school upon his completion uh, of high school. Well, that tells you what I did Sunday. <laughs> but uh, he's got a good friend trying to persuade him the other way. And so the war is on. 
Uh, no, but uh, either either place is a good place. Now, the reason I said all that is because he led us in Soldiers of Christ to Rise. That is our school song, if you want to identify it or call it that way. And brother, you just can't leave that song without singing all the verses. But that's all right. Not, not a problem. In chapel, uh, the, we are limited to two verses due to time constraints and whatnot. And so that happens a lot of times, too. I got in trouble the other day because I told the students, if you're going to lead that song, just lead all verses. Tell them Gibson told you, and I'll just take the hit. I took the hit, so I changed. But uh, nonetheless, it is great to be here this evening and uh, continue to uh, meet people I've heard of, people that I've never met, those that have seen in the past. Uh, Wendy, uh, my wife, was able to come this evening. Uh, they, they gave her a weekend pass there at work, and so uh, she was able to to travel and be uh, with us tonight as well. We are down to two lessons tonight and tomorrow. I want to invite and encourage you to uh, come tomorrow night as we discuss the subject of marriage. Uh, this is a, a huge issue in the world today. And it is one of the institutions that God established. And he has things in place for us to have a successful marriage and we can have that and we will be uh, looking into the, those things but for tonight i want us to consider hard sayings of jesus and you say how is that even possible it is true our lord and savior who left heaven and came to this earth and he has some hard things to say now you might be thinking well what did he say to the pharisees that, that's probably some uh, pretty hard stuff there well in the religious world today, brethren, there is much to do about the idea of positive preaching and negative preaching. Call it what you want. I would say that we need both of them to preach the whole counsel of God. And if we did not realize it, a lot of times that's the way this life works. Do you realize none of us got here this evening? without positive and negative working together, it's called the car battery. And if they weren't working together, we would not be here right now. I would like to think of it more as a balance in preaching. But there are some places where if a preacher is going to preach against sin, he is often branded as unloving and negative. By the way, preaching against that sin is usually the sin that the person is committing and offended by. And now you are a negative preacher. You pick whatever it is you want. Uh, a little bit of uh, uh, some talking before services this evening. Social drinking. Alternative homosexual lifestyle. Marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Those are all hot potato topics. And it's sad to see. Can we turn to the Bible and look to God's word to see what he would have us to do in any of these situations? Well, this evening, we're going to look at something that some will consider positive and others will consider negative. If you will, please turn your Bibles to John chapter 3 and verse number 16. We're going to look at it from two different approaches, or we're going to handle it from two different approaches tonight. And the first one we're going to see is this idea, the hard sayings of Jesus. Sometimes elders will get hold of a preacher and say, you cannot preach that or you're not preaching positive. Stop preaching negative. By this, what they're usually telling the preacher to do is you need to keep it a little more general. Preacher, you're getting a little too specific. Preacher, you're stepping on some people's toes. I had a preacher, I learned this the other day from a retired preacher. He says, Matt, come here. He says, when someone tells you that you have stepped on their toes, you look them in the eye. And you profusely apologize and say, I'm sorry, brother or sister, I was aiming for the heart. And I thought, wow, I hadn't heard that one, or if I had, I forgot it. And uh, just a, another pearl uh, picked up there. But generally, if you're saying you're negative, you need to change it up. They're asking you to get a little more general and to stop identifying sin that people need to deal with, or it's going to cost them their soul. They're not going to make it uh, to heaven. Brethren, they feel that they want the preacher or the preacher should preach and leave others alone. And so tonight we're going to decide 
We, will we compromise or will we stand firm on the truth of God's word? What is a positive sermon? Well, if you look up in the dictionary, the word uh, positive, Webster says a motion or device that is definite, unyielding, constant, or certain in action. To preach positive or to preach negative implies that there is an opposite, which we've already established here this evening. And so let us ask ourselves, does God, through his revealed will to us, call for us to water down his word? Do we soften up on things? Maybe, maybe we start doing like some of these non-denominational, we do not teach the entirety of getting right with God. And we just leave it to good old stories and a mental acknowledgement and try to do good and we're going to heaven. God forbid that we ever cease, Jude 7, contending earnestly for the faith that was once and delivered. Brother, it's a blessing to us that God has given it, spelled it out, given us specifics so that we know what pleases him. Let me give you an example. You ever after services decide, hey, you know what? We're going to go out and eat. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go with you. What happens next? Where are we going to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you? No one wants to offend anyone. No one wants to make a decision. And we spend 10 minutes or maybe 17 figuring out where we're going to eat. Now, that's not a crime in of itself. But God doesn't work like that when our souls are at stake. And so in John 3 and verse 16, what we're going to look at are the words of Jesus. And I want us to ask ourselves, can we use John 3, 16, preach it, and leave others alone? Number one, well, I guess maybe we should look at the verse. I just assume we all know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. One of the most beloved verses in the Bible. Is that true? Probably one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. Is that true? Probably so. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. But consider this for just a moment. The word of God offends the atheist. Atheism is one of the fastest growing religions. And yes, brethren and friends, it is a religion in the United States of America today. Atheism says that there is no God. Now, I don't know how that's possible from a common sense standpoint, but that's what they are advocating. As a matter of fact, brethren, atheists are becoming militant. Keep your eye out for that. I'm not trying to scare us this evening, but I'm just saying the reality of the situations and what is going on. There's now societies, organizations, groups for the advancement of atheism. Watch your children. Watch your grandchildren. Watch any little child. Be mindful of who's teaching them and what they are being taught. We also have, unfortunately, in the church, practical atheists. These are folks that believe there is a God, but they live as though they are the devil. Do you know what I mean by that? They're there on Sunday morning, but they're dancing with the devil on Monday night. That's a practical atheist. So we see the word God in John 3.16, our beloved passage, offends the atheist. Should Jesus not have mentioned the name God so as not to offend someone? Now, as we work through this lesson, I did not come here this evening saying, all right, I'm going to get these brethren worked up and let's see how we can go out tomorrow and just offend the entire city of Killeen. That's not our mission. But we must stand for the truth. To preach about God offends the atheists. Are we to refuse being positive about the living God by failing to exalt God and call him by his name? Heaven forbid we would be guilty of such. Let's look at the next one. For God so loved. This offends what we call the deist. Now, the deist is an interesting study in of itself. Some of our founding fathers of this great country were deists, but the deist believes in God as a creator. That's a good thing. We're off to a good start. But as you continue to look at that, they deny that God works in the affairs of mankind today. The deist, 
the best way I know is to illustrate it. You remember, I don't even know if they still make them. The old alarm clocks that you had to wind up and you could hear tick, tick, that kind of helped me sleep in the deer camp at night growing up. Uh, but you know, you had to wind that thing up and it just, it did its job until it ran out. And then what did you have to do? Wind it up again. Well, the deist says that God created us, created this earth. He wound us up as tight as that alarm clock could go. And he's just waiting for the time to stop. Brother, and that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, how did God so loved? There is action in the affairs of man on God's part. Their concept is God wound us up. He's waiting for us to run down. And he's basically just withdrawn himself. He's like grandpa sitting in the rocking chair on the porch, whittling a stick away, waiting for life to take place and finish its course. They believe in deity, but they make God very impersonal. That's not the God of the Bible. God so loved that he gave denies this concept. Think what it would have been if God had withdrawn. If there was no Jesus, if there was no Bible, we would have no Savior. We would have no purpose. We would do what is right in our own eyes with whatever consequences there are. Brethren, God is very much a part of our lives. I would caution us as the Lord's church to not let the denominational world with their psycho babble and hogwash preaching about Holy Spirit and God's providence ruin what the Bible teaches on the truth of this matter. Why would God not be involved? Why would the Heavenly Father abandon us? That's just not so. Now, I'm not claiming miracles up here this evening. You know better than that. But, brethren, God has not distanced himself, put himself in the back corner or kicked us out and just waiting for us to finish. Someone who would say that has not studied their Old Testaments very well. Someone who would advocate that has not read their New Testament. God is going to carry out his will, whether we're on his side or not. God is active. God is working today. God loved us sufficiently enough that what did we study? Nothing but the blood. You remember our lesson from Sunday? Nothing but the blood. God loved us so much that he gave us his blood. That's a God that's active. To be positive about love, brethren, offends our deist friends. Let's keep working through the verse. For God so loved that he gave what? Only begotten son. Preacher, who might that offend? Brethren, that offends the Jew and the modernist. Maybe some groups that we are not as familiar with in our walk in life, but we might be familiar with uh, their philosophies and their teachings. You see, Judaism, now not every single one of them, but a good portion of them do, at least today, they contend that Jesus that we read about in this Bible was an imposter, that he was fake, that he is not the promised Messiah, that he is not divine. You start taking away the deity of Jesus and we're going to have issues. But that's what they are advocating. They fail to look at the evidence of deity. They fail to look at the miraculous birth, the miracles themselves, the resurrection. How about the ascension back up to sit on the right hand of God Almighty? They do not recognize those things. Shall we fail to be pros uh, positive in proclaiming these truths? Brother, that's what our life is all about, isn't it? Oh, yes, he had to be born, but we go back to that blood-stained cross, and we go back to that resurrection coming up out of that tomb. Or as Paul would teach us in 1 Corinthians 15, it is all for nothing. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, it's vanity. We are not, we're the ones that are fools instead of the atheist, or the one, as the psalmist says in four, chapter 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. By the way, brethren, that's not an atheist speaking there. That is a prideful, arrogant guy that you want to run away from as fast as you can. Because what that person is saying there in Psalm 14, 1, it says, I know for a fact that I am not going to listen, even if there is this God of the Bible. Mm -mm -mm. I don't want to be there. That's for sure. The modernist or modernism is a very, very broad term. It's usually uh, a definition of those who have a very, very liberal view about the things of God. 
What do I mean? The modernists will say that Jesus was not divine, but he was just a son like you and me. Every male in this audience this evening is a son to a mama and to a dad. Whatever that case might be, that's how God created us biologically, and that's never going to change. And so any of us, he would say, uh, the martyrs would say that Jesus is just like us. Matter of fact, maybe you've heard it this way before. They refer to Jesus, are you ready, as a historical Jesus. If you ever hear that terminology, I'm not saying tuck and run, but be sure and investigate what is being said there and what is meant by that. Now, what does John 3.16 do for us? Well, where we are in our set of words, only begotten denies this teaching. Now, what does only begotten mean there in John 3.16? Singly existent, alone, solitary. The tense of these words in the original language, in the Greek language, means that Jesus was the only one of his kind. Unique. There is none other like him. We also read of him having the preeminence. To be positive about this, brethren, only begotten, the only one of his kind, offends the Jew and it offends the modernist. The most beloved verse in the Bible, and we can't even use it because we might offend somebody. You see what we're getting at, brethren? There are topics that people don't want to discuss because you're going to bother them. You're going to disturb them. And so we just don't talk about things, things. Well, if you're going to go that route and use that reasoning, we can't even use John 3.16. Then everybody knows. Understand what I mean by that. But we're not done. Look at the next one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever and world. Whosoever and world. So your turn. Those words might offend who? They offend what we call the Calvinist. Now, most of the denominations in the world today that we would be familiar with, you know, Colleen has a lot of religion in this town. It's a lot of misguided religion. Driving through the town here and there, and, you know, GPS takes me a different way. I've been here three days in a row, and GPS has taken me a different way every single time. Not through Colleen itself, but getting here, and that's okay. But I've noticed, you know, leaving, I'll take a different. There's a lot of religion in this town. It reminds me of when Paul was on Mars Hill. And there was all these altars to all these gods. Remember what Paul did there? Let me tell you about your unknown God here altar. He preached an outstanding lesson there in Acts chapter 17. But my point is, a lot of denominations today are going to have Calvinistic thinking or ideology and the things that they believe in. Now, John Calvin is what we call a Reformation leader. And he advanced this doctrine that God foreordained or that God predestined. I know that what, what are you talking about, preacher? It's Tuesday night, foreordained and, and predestined. What the Calvinist will say is that God has already decided whether you are going to be saved or you are going to be lost. And you have now here, here's the bad part of it. You have no decision making in the matter. That's what Calvinism says. It is true that God foreordained. It is true that God has predestined every single soul, either to heaven or to hell. But he's giving us the choice to make so that he can make the decision in the day of judgment. Calvinism says, no, Matt, you don't have that option. If God calls you, you're not going to be able to resist it. And that's exactly what you are going to do. Do you realize where that puts the burden on just one lost soul in the day of judgment? That puts a burden on God. We would have to say that God is sending souls to hell. Well, he is, but that's what he's obeyed. Brother, if we go to hell, it'll be because we sent ourselves there. We, uh, can I say, force the hand of God? God has given us his will. God has given his son. God has done everything for us to be able to go to heaven. He desires that all people be saved. He's not the author of confusion. How much Bible we got to go here to say that God loves us. And so my point being is it'll be a decision that we make or the lack thereof. God has predestined us to heaven or hell, but he has given us a choice 
in the matter. Something that our modern day friends do not realize in the denominational world about this type of thinking it's, is it's very dangerous. Can you imagine being here this evening? Hopefully you're here because we want to go to heaven, right? We're here to worship God. We're here to have fellowship with our brothers and sisters, lock arms together, and we're in this battle together. Soldiers of Christ arise. The devil's not going to get in here tonight. If he is, we'll box his ears and kick him out of here. But what about tomorrow when we're working with that denominational acquaintance or friend? who believes that they are waiting for a sign. They're waiting for something in their life to happen to say, that's God calling me. That's God giving me a sign. Can you imagine living your whole life in walking in righteousness and never have an experience in your life that signifies God is calling you? Well, I guess you're not predestined for heaven. Remember, you do not have a choice in the matter with these folks. I don't know about that religion. The story is told in the 1800s. There was a meeting much like this. Back then, they did not have indoor plumbing. And one of the people attending the services needed to use a restroom, so they went to the old-fashioned outhouse, right? When they were in that outhouse, there was a light coming in. Man, they knew it. That was God giving them a sign. They were at a religious service. They were in an enclosed building, and there's some light coming through. You know what it was? A full moon night and a piece of uh, the knot and the lumber that made the uh, outhouse had fallen out and the light was shining through the hole. Brother, a lot of people committed suicide in the past because they lived their lives the best that they could waiting for God to call and God never would call. Brother John 3, 16, we are here this evening to say that whosoever and the world includes everybody for salvation that god wants all people to be saved what this doctrine does is make god a respecter of persons that's contrary to what the bible tells us acts chapter 10 verses 34 and 35 our god is no respecter of persons the words world and whosoever teach us that christ died for whom everybody there is not one person that ever has lived, is living, or will live that our Jesus did not shed his blood for on that cross. Jesus died for all of humanity. The word whosoever. So the word world, that gets us all. Red, yellow, black and white, purple, yellow, it does not matter. Brother Phil and I were talking about this at supper about a brother in Jamaica. I cannot, he, he could give it to you as a matter of services. And I mentioned it yesterday, but we get off the plane at the airport. He had this big old speaker on his minivan and he'd be preaching. Now, back then there was no air conditioning or anything. So you heard everything. And he would be preaching. That speaker would be at full volume and he would be preaching to everyone coming and going out. And it's a madhouse. You ever seen fire ants after a grasshopper or something? They're just all over that's how it is at the jamaica airport all right people going everywhere and he'd be out there preaching he, he'd get hey, let me have your attention i forget the actual exact words but he'd go wise and otherwise i always thought that was funny and he'd start preaching the gospel while we're getting our baggage and luggage what i say on it because jesus died for everyone in the world and then when the bible john 3 16 uses whosoever brethren that makes it personal God is dialing in on each and every one of us and saying, I have sent my only begotten son for you. But you see, John 3, 16 is going to offend some of our friends today. Look at our next word. Whosoever believeth. What might that word believeth offend? It is another school of thought that is called universalism. Or universalist is a person. And what they believe is a doctrine that all men will be saved regardless of what they believe. Isn't that interesting how you have something like Calvinism? You got to work your tail off and hopefully God will call you if you've been predestined. And then you have the universalist says, oh, don't worry about it. Everyone's going to go to heaven. Live like the devil. That's a lot of the mentality today. You all have some good old boys in Colleen, Texas. 
Oh, they fuss and cuss and look cool and everything else during the week, but then they'll take their families and show up on Sunday morning, smile, and then return to the ways of the world the next day. You see, it doesn't matter because we're all going to go to heaven. They believe that a man will be saved even if someone believes in idols. Again, someone's not reading their Old Testament. Someone's not understanding what God thought about when his people and others decided to do idolatry and calf worship and whatnot. The principle, and so I'm going to mention some things here and I'm going to qualify. And I, I will be happy to discuss, sit down, chat with anyone that might hear this, but I am not out to seek trouble. I am out to preach the truth because I love God and I understand what he did in sending his son for me. But rather the universalist is a principle of what we call the Unitarian Church. They have and accept all and stand for nothing thought process. Well, I never heard of Unitarian Church. You ever heard of Cowboy Church? You ever heard of we are a non-denominational? You ever heard of we are a community church? Again, brother, no harm, no foul. I don't mean anything ugly, and I'm not going to keep apologizing for this, and we never apologize for the truth. But it's almost sad that I can't even say there's some people like this that are going to be offended by it because it offends them, so I shouldn't say it. What? Is that what I read about the Apostle Paul? Is that what I read about Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21? Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You think about that. You want to talk about another hard saying of Jesus. Not everyone that claims to be a Christian is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Believe in Christ places a condition on salvation. And that's what he's saying here, that you have to believe. Repenting of our sins, that places a condition on our salvation. Jesus would say in Luke 13 and verse 3, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you will perish. That's pretty clear, pretty straight, pretty simple, is it not? Romans 10.10 10 teaches us this. For with, the uh, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Are you ready? And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And getting right with God, there is a confession that must take place. And then this one here. Mark 16, 16 says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Brethren, someone ever struggling with baptism, and this is not original with me by any means. Some of you are going to know where I'm going at. You go to Mark 16, 16. And you say, you see these words of Jesus? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And they want to argue about, oh, all you have to do is believe. Change it up in terms that they understand. Now, you're not taking the place of Jesus, but let's just say you have an abundance of resources. And that person you're studying with, you say, you know what? Phil... If you will believe and be baptized in Gibson's name, I'm going to give you $10 million. Do you think Brother Phil's going to argue with me about whether he should be baptized or not? Show me the water. I'm ready. Isn't it amazing how we put it in terms that interest us? We can all of a sudden see the light and understand it. Brother, Satan is working hard to cloud our judgment, to cloud our common sense. Simply take the Bible, what is that, and understand that believing is going to upset some people. Saving faith is an active faith. James chapter 2, verse 14 and following brings this out. That faith alone is nothing more than something that is dead. And so, shall we cease being positive for our friends in the community? A lot of them falling in this category. And then we have the words perish and eternal life. John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, what? Should not perish, but have everlasting life. These words are going to offend what we call the materialist. Materialism is the doctrine that matter would. Material things 
is the only reality and all other things can be explained through physical. The fancy word is empirical. And that's the way everything can be explained. Its concept would do away with the spiritual element of man. There's no soul. There's no heaven. There's no hell. And it's all through that of matter. Now, brethren, you probably have met some people that believe this. When I say materialist, you may, I don't know if I've ever met a materialist. Our Jehovah Witness friends hold and cling to a lot of the materialistic point of view. What I mean by this is they try to explain away the reality of the soul and hell and make heaven to be material instead of spiritual. What do I mean? If you're not one of the ones in that religion that is going to heaven, then when you're dead, you're like a dog, you're like over, you're just dead all over. Now, if you love your pet, sorry, they're not going to be in heaven. Only eight souls came out of that ark. But what I'm getting at is they teach that when you're done here on this earth, it's more of an annihilation. Kind of like you just dissipate. Did I say that right? Students aren't here to correct me, but y'all can if you want to. It won't hurt my feelings. We just kind of dissolve away into nothing, except for those that are going to heaven. The error is interpreting the Bible with a preconceived idea of a materialism. Now, what does our passage teach us? The passage teaches us that man will spend an eternity in one of two places, and again, depending on our choice. The word perish in John 3.16 does not mean annihilation or dissolve or kind of... Anyone ever play with dry ice? Maybe I should be careful how I ask that question. Anyone ever use dry ice? And you know what happens? It turns from a solid to a gas, and you look down, and you're like, where'd that go? It like kind of just vanishes, disappears. That's the idea here, what they're saying. The word perish does not mean annihilation, but it means destruction. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be, what? Damned. That shows something beyond what they want us to uphold. To preach positive here is to deny materialism. Brethren, what does it mean to preach positive? I submit to you this evening that to preach positive is to follow that which is taught in Ephesians 4 and verse 15. So whether it is a Unitarian, a Calvinist, a Modernist, an Atheist, any of these things that we have mentioned, we preach and teach in love. That means we're going to have the right attitude. Brethren, you can have the right attitude and be as ugly as you can with your works. I would challenge us to revisit but it also doesn't mean, you know, to talk real soft and bring some flowers. And you know, that, that's not even, we're turning the spiritual discussion, the, the, the soul into something materialistic. Be who you are. Love souls as our Lord loved souls and had compassion on them and teach the truth in love. No doubt we all are dynamic and different in our personalities and God through his providence will reach us or use us to reach people. What do I mean by that? Well, there might be someone that I can reach that Brother Fisher would have a hard time doing so. Now, let's just immediately reverse that. There might be something, you know, uh, Grayson, I've been learning about him. He's a lineman. I told him tonight, why didn't he fly helicopters? Those are some impressive lining. You know, but he's our best friend right now. I promise you, if we have an electrical problem and the AC shuts down, you know what I mean by that? All right. And so it might be that his background, his understanding and where he's from, one of you might be able to better reach Grayson than someone else. That's okay. We're in this together. There's not a competition here. We're not keeping a tally on who can have more Bible studies or baptize more people. We are working to be soul winners for Jesus to the glory of God. And so hopefully you see in John 3, 16, brethren, you cannot use one of the most beloved texts in all of the Bible without offending, dare I say, a large group of people in this world today. A large group of people. Now, watch this. And this will be the last here this evening. I'm just going to mention it, and then we'll, we'll shut it down here. Well, you know what? Let me see here. Oh, we still got three hours. Someone said I could go to midnight tonight. <laughs> Is that laughing like amen or laughing like, yeah, right? 
I get you. I get you. I understand. But I do want us to notice something about John 3.16 here. This passage has been abused and misused and misapplied and perverted to support things like the damnable doctrine of faith alone. Brethren, do not let people do that to the scripture. Do not do that yourself. Look at this. One of the greatest texts. Watch how we switch this now. We're using the same verse. The greatest influence man has ever known. God. Well, we can have our heroes and our superstars and sports stars and I guess music and whatever else people get uh, excited and caught up again today. But the great, we can even have our favorite Bible people. But the greatest influence man has ever known and will ever know is God Almighty. You realize we are a creature of influence. We are a creature of influence. We begin our life being influenced by our parents. Matter of fact, I tell a story, but uh, our daughter, I think, was it Lindsay? Lindsay or Jacob? Jacob's our oldest. And our grandson, you know, a new grandpa's got to get grandson in a sermon somehow, right? But he skinned to the point where he's starting to eat some real food. And they sent us a picture. I'm not sure what they were feeding that poor child, but I know I would not have eaten it myself. And I was like, I, I asked Wendy on the way up here, I wonder if mama and daddy tried that stuff. Have y'all ever tried some of the baby food that's out there? No offense, but some of that would gag a maggot. All right. And I'm like, what are they feeding? That? I said, send them over to granddad and Gigi's house. We'll take care of them. Uh, I got in trouble the other day for giving them a sucker just to lick on it a little bit. But my point being is we grew up being influenced by our parents. You young people, you have godly parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles in your life. You get on bed knee tonight and you thank God for that opportunity. Because you think of all the people in this world that do not have that privilege. And if they do not figure it out, if they do not get to the truth, they're going to be lost in the devil's hell. Man, we are a blessed people. We are a privileged people. Be thankful. Do not take that for granted. I know we're going to butt heads here and there. Be thankful you have people that are close enough to you and love you enough that you are influenced for what is good and what is right. But know this, God is our greatest and our best influence. Number two, what was our next words? God so loved the greatest degree of love ever known to man. Who might you look to in your life and say, man, those people are in love. I'm not talking about puppy dog love, you know, where she bats the eyes and he gets all excited and, you know, they're learning it. I'm talking about people that have loved each other through thick and thin and overcome the battles and whatnot. I was reading a story the other day. Very young mom, very young mom has stage three ovarian cancer. They have tried everything known to man to stop it. It's not working. She has resigned herself to accept the fate of what's coming and trying to spend every precious moment she can with her husband and with her child before she leaves this earth. And as I was like, how can I reach this lady? How can I find this person and get some information to her? She's not going to be here much longer. Would you change your life today if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? Think about that in just a few minutes when we get to the invitation song. Because if you would change your life today, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow based upon this golden text, friend, I invite you to come forward. It's time to change because you know what? Tomorrow may never come. It may happen tonight. The Lord may return. Are you prepared to meet your God? The greatest love, degree of love. You know, what do we usually love if you were to put it in order? Ourselves, our wealth, our family, others. You know, God's somewhere in the picture, but he kind of gets blurred out sometimes, unless I get in trouble. Then I'll move him to the front until things get going good again. Then he just, he doesn't ever really leave, but he just kind of blurs, you know, a little bit. God is not pleased with selfish love. God's love is unlimited and unselfish. God so loved the world. That he gave us his son. Brother Fisher mentioned one of my favorite verses the other night. Joshua 24, 15. You better believe it. 
I mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, 58 last night, I believe. Well, here's another one. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, what? You can finish it. Christ died for us. This degree of love maybe cannot be fully understood this side of eternity, but it is understood in that his only begotten, unique, one of a kind, singly existent son have loved us so much that he went to the cross for each and every one of us. The world and whosoever, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, world, whosoever, remember, world is big, all of us, whosoever gets personal on each and every one of us, the greatest extent of God's love. This idea of world suggests a scope of God's word, of God's love, and the word whosoever suggests the individual. Do you know some of our brothers still to this day have a problem with the color of skin in folks? It makes no sense to me whatsoever, brother. And when I come across brethren like that in travels, and it doesn't happen too often, thankfully, but it ought not to be happening at all. I ask them, who do they think Jesus was? What color do you think Jesus was? Go beyond that. It doesn't matter what color we are. We poke our skin. We're all going to bleed red. Unless we're an alien. That don't happen. That don't exist. God's extent. Uh, uh, the extent of God's love. Reaches everywhere brethren. Everywhere. The two greatest promises ever given to mankind. Are also in this verse. Shall not. Should not perish. And eternal life. Our Heavenly Father has made provisions for us so that we do not die in our sins and that we do not live in a lake of fire and brimstone. So go back to that grandparent thing again. You hear the grandkids are coming over. What do you do? Trash the house? Empty the pantry? Oh, no, no, no. We're going to get that house ready. We're going to get the toys and the puzzles. We're going to go get the popsicles and the cookies and the fruit. Families coming to town. We get a little excited about that, don't we? What did Jesus say in John 14, verse 1 and following? He's gone to prepare a place for us. And if he's gone to prepare a place for us, he's going to come back and he's going to get us. Brethren, do we believe that this evening? God's great promises. Finally, Greatest opportunity that man ever had is in John 3, 16. Whosoever believes in him. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? We discussed that Sunday morning in Bible. I've tried to connect these together. I hope you kind of see the woven thread through, through these lessons. But Sunday morning in Bible class, we were talking about something more than just a mental acknowledgement of Jesus. And make this illustration real quick. If mental acknowledgement is sufficient, I want every one of us tonight to believe that we are multi-millionaires. And tomorrow, write us check to Southwest School of Bible Studies. Man, with no student will ever have to seek support again because it's going to happen. I believe it, right? It's not about mental acknowledgement, brother. And that's included, but it's not where it is limited at. It is more than that. Saving faith is an act of faith. Because I believe in God, here I am, send me. I am ready to work, Lord. Thank you for all that you have done. Why have many not believed and obeyed the gospel? Many have not heard the gospel. That's on us. We've got to get the message out there. Many believe that the works of obedience are not necessary. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. Some love the praise of men more than they do the acknowledgement of God. So they will not obey the gospel. Many have a hardened heart. It's calloused over and cannot be penetrated until they soften it up. So, brethren, tonight I want us to ask ourselves, 
I've stressed this before. This has been something on my mind here lately, uh, or I say lately, the last couple of years. Wendy might say three or four years. There is a process to get right with God Almighty. We've already discussed that back towards the beginning part of the sermon. And once we get right with God, soldiers of Christ arise because the enemy is coming full attack mode, flaming fiery arrows and all to try and knock us down. I know y'all's VBS this year is going to be the armor of God. What a beautiful section of scripture there in Ephesians chapter six. Do you realize in that armor of God, in Ephesians chapter six, there is no protection on the backside? You ever thought about that? God has given us the sword of the spirit to go into battle and he's given us the armor that we need. And so as Christians, brethren, made tonight, we know not, we do not wake up to be offensive, but we are soldiers called to fight, contend earnestly for the faith, for our own salvation and for the salvation of others. If you are not a Christian, we would love to study with you. We will sit down and gladly show you what God would have you to do. He's the one that's going to save you. If you are a Christian and falling short, maybe you've softened up on God's word. And it's time to stand once again for the whole counsel of God. Maybe there are struggles in your life and you need encouragement. Brethren, we're in this together. We are in this together. There's nothing to be ashamed in saying, hey, you know what, brother, sister? I need your hand. I need your hug. I need your prayers. Let's get after it. If there's anything we can do for you, pray for you this evening, please come while we stand and while we sing. He has been before. Let me sing this song. And the Holy One, Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, let me open now to me your heart. If you will, he will depart. Let me Now I did he will speak your sins for you. And with your Standing for our closing song and closing prayer, and singing for the soul never dies. Five thirty six, first and last verse. You ready? Let us sing. To Canaan's land, I went where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day. When 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel message this evening. We thank you for giving us another day of life to enable us to come be fed spiritually. We thank you for Brother Gibson and his message, Father, that have fed us, that nurtures us, and keeps us in your word. We pray for him and his family that they'll continue to be faithful to you, and that through Christ Jesus our Lord, bless him to bless others continually with your word. We ask, Father, that as we leave one of us presence tonight, we will take those words which we heard from, from your scriptures tonight and apply them and live them in our lives. We pray for those who are not members of the Church of Christ, that they will be studying with someone who is knowledgeable, that they will understand that your son will build one church, that they will obey the truth before it's everlasting too late. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. We, we, we never going through this world without your love. And we need you, Lord, to protect us from the devil. Protect our children and our grandchildren from this false teaching and these sick devices that are in our society. Father, be with us until we meet again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.